So welcome back everybody. Welcome to the course of wireless security. In today's lecture, we will talk about a very important, exciting concept called jamming. Jamming at the physical layer. Now, if you remember from the previous lectures, we talked about denial of service attacks, and we mentioned clearly that denial of service attack can happen at any layer, at the application, at the presentation, session, transport, network, Mac, and physical. But we said that jamming or denial of service attack, it's the same, you can, you can consider jamming as a denial of service attack as well, it, it's extremely severe when it happens at the physical layer because when it happens at the physical layer there is no way you can really you can you cannot really have a solid mechanism that can stop this attack as compared to as compared to attacks that can happen at the upper layers so what we mean by jamming jamming is when an intruder or a malicious user, malicious device, whatever you want to name it, call it, you can consider it any way you want it. When it uses advanced tools and uh, advanced communication devices in order to send harmful signals that can stop the communication between the legitimate transmitter and receiver. So as you can see here in this slide, you have a sender and you have a receiver the sender, while the signal is being transmitted to the receiver, it gets affected by path loss. And path loss is, we all know, is a large scale effect that get, that, that basically reduces the power of the signal as travels in distance, in time. And then an additive white gas and noise is added to the signal when it reaches the receiver. So this is the normal communication when there is no jamming, no interference, nothing. But what will happen when when a receiver or a device injects a signal into your communication and this signal operates on the same frequency as your transmitted signal. In this case, basically, just visualize the case, picture the scenario. You have an original signal and you have another signal that's coming exactly on top of that signal. Has the same time, the same frequency, the same resources, the same span, the same window, and both signals are becoming superimposed on top of each other. So the receiver, when the receiver tries to decode the signal, he's no longer receiving the actual, uh, the actual intended signal. He's receiving signal with another signal. So he gets confused. I'm trying to decode, but I'm not getting the bit, the bit, I'm not getting the right bits. I'm not getting the right content. I'm not getting the right signal. So what will happen? The receiver will keep asking for retransmission re from the transmitter, telling the transmitter that I tried to decode the packet, but unfortunately I couldn't decode it successfully. So can you please resend again? The transmitter says, okay, I will resend the packet again, but make sure you can decode it this time. He says, yes, I promise I will be able to decode it this time. When he send the when the transmitter send resends the packet again, and the interference signal is still there, so it it gets superimposed. The receiver again asks, "Please, I couldn't decode the signal." Then there is something we call maximum number of transmission in the uh, ARQ protocol, automatic repeat request protocol. When that maximum number of retransmission is reached, so the the receiver is forced. To, de to, re uh, to record failed, deco failed packet decoding. So in this case, he just drops the packet and just forget and uh, lose the communication or lose the content of that packet. If, that, if this continues for so many packets that uh, come after this packet and uh, the same thing happens to all the other subsequent packets, then in this case, we, call, we, we will observe that the communication is collapsing and failing because the receiver is not getting anything out of the transmitted message and therefore there is no communication. Now, picture another scenario 
where I where you have your access point inside your home or you have the cellular wireless cellular towers outside that are serving you with uh, 4G signal and you get connected and you get uh, an internet access from them while you are driving or you are outside of the home uh, and imagine an attacker that launches a jamming attack to these uh, cells so what will happen in this case the whole network will stop you will lose your 4g connection or 3g 2g whatever and there is little thing that operators can do against this attack so the networks current networks are built assuming that we don't have attackers like this who can attack our network that's the assumption but you know these wireless devices are getting uh, less expensive day after day they are becoming cheaper and they are available in the hands of many engineers many normal many normal people sometimes and the, the, the this trend is going to make these devices available in the hands of people just like mobiles just like PCs and if if we reach to that case then it becomes really dangerous to operate uh, to operate a network that's not resilient against jamming attacks or interference attacks sometimes so now what are the different types of jamming i mean is ja are all jamming attacks the same are they doing the same thing or there are some differences between them so we have different types of jamming attacks and those are classified into five categories we are going to go through them one by one and explain the meaning and the implications of each one of them and the differences between them in the next coming slide so the first jammer the first type we call it constant jammer constant jamming attack what does this mean this means that a jamming the a jamming signal is continuously transmitted from the attacker to the towards the receiver or the transmitter to stop the communication and how you can detect this if you want to detect this so there are certain statistical tests that can be exploited for the detection of the constant jammer such as the received signal strength carrier sensing time and packet error rate so for example to detect that there is a constant jammer yeah, you you just see the the signal you receive you compare the signal you receive under jamming with the signal that you receive in normal condition and you see that there is a huge difference in the uh, received signal strength you will see a jump in the signal power in the signal level that you receive why is this jump because there is another signal that's adding its power on top of the original signal power and the summation will be usually uh, much larger than if it was just one signal another way of detecting this uh, jamming attack is carrier sensing time and packet error rate if you constantly keep recording uh, packet loss and you are not able to decode any information out of these packets then obviously you are under a constant jamming attack so how do you defend against attack there is the reactive and the proactive frequency hopping spread spectrum so basically you try to uh, keep hopping from one frequency to another jumping from one frequency to another this is you change this in the setting of the transmitter device and the receiver device so you, the assumption here is that the transmit both the transmitter and receiver assume they have a sequence that's shared securely between them and based on this sequence the the transmitter and receiver change their trans, change their carrier frequency in such a way that only the transmitter and receiver can synchronize to each other and assume the attacker he will just keep transmitting on one single frequency but what's less known what's not assumed is the fact that these codes are publicly available in the standard so the, the, uh, an intelligent hacker a smart hacker 
will read the standard document first and see these patterns that they change that they change the frequency according to them and use this in order to synchronize with the hopping with the frequency hopping with the frequency jumping and therefore this mechanism will not be effective anymore the frequency hopping spread spectrum because the the jammer will also look it will also uh, synchronize to that sequence and therefore it will change its it's the it, it will change the carrier frequency according to the sequence he obtained from the standard document so this is the constant jammer there is another jammer called uh, intermittent jammer where a jamming signal is emitted from time to time this is you can call it sporadic jammer where you don't constantly keep uh, jamming your signal so th th this is like uh, when when the transmitter is talking to the receiver the jammer detects that there is a communication and then at that point exactly it starts sending the jamming signal now if the transmitter stops sending any signals to the receiver then the, re the jammer will detect that there is no communication going on and there is no point of keeping transmitting and wasting my power because my goal at the end of the day is to, uh, to, to, to prevent the communication, to stop the communication. And if they are not communicating with each other, then why should I keep transmitting power? It's waste of power. Just I stop, I get silent. The other advantage here, it's harder to detect intermittent jammer compared to constant jammer. Why is that? Because when you when the transmitter stops sending, the jammer stands, stops jamming. So so you try you try to see the R the uh, you try to see the difference in the RSSI or the difference in the signal to noise ratio. You see that whenever I'm sending, it's the same as an R. And when I stop, I don't get any message. I, I don't get any jamming signal. This confuses the receiver in the detection process, but still there, the, 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 the packet error rate method will be able to detect that there is a jamming scenario going on here. The third type is reactive jammer, and in this case, a jamming signal is only imposed when the legitimate transmission is detected to be active. So this is this is just like the previous one. This is just like the previous one, but this the previous one. The, it can it can happen not only uh, based on the activity between the transmitter and receiver, but it can happen in random manner. But this the reactive jammer can happen only only when there is a signal going on between the transmitter and receiver. So the detection for this type of jamming is much harder than the previous ones and it affects only reception. And the, to, to overcome this jamming, the only way to do is to, to adopt something called a direct sequence spread spectrum. So basically you spread your signal below the noise level so that you don't get detected. But the problem with this spread spectrum technique is all is the same problem with uh, this technique suffers from the same problem that frequency hopping spread spectrum suffers from because both techniques depends on assuming uh, the knowledge of a shared sequence between the transmitter and receiver. And if this shared sequence is known by the attacker, then the attacker will be able to get the signal back. The fourth type is adaptive jammer, where a jamming signal is tailored to the level of received power at the legitimate receiver. Why this is important and how is that different from the previous ones? Now, suppose you are, uh, you, you are, you are a jammer and you want to jam a receiver who's far from you uh, 10 meters away. So what, what would be the power that will prevent the receiver from receiving any meaningful communication from the transmitter. Would it be the same as the power that you would need if the receiver is far from you 
10 kilometers instead of 10 meter? Of course, it's not going to be the same. The farther the user is from you, the more power you need to send so that you can harm its reception. The closer it gets to you, the less power you need to send so that you can harm its reception. Because at the end of the day, the receiver has certain sensitivity. And we all know that our communication gets affected by path loss, fading, blockage. So if I'm transmitting, let's say, 10 dB of power, and after one kilometer, how much power would be left of this 10 dB? It might be like in minus 100 dB. So would the receiver be able to detect this? Yes. In the normal case, yes, if there is no jammer. What if there is jammer who's very close to the receiver? How much power this jammer would need to stop the communication, to stop the reception at the receiver side? It would just need to transmit little, little amount of power so that it can just degrade the reception threshold at the receiver and makes it harder for him to decode any signal. But what if the jammer is very far from the receiver? What, 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 how much power this jammer should transmit so that it can affect the receiver? Too much power because he, the jammer is very far, the distance is large, and you need to compensate for the path loss. You need to compensate, to compensate for the loss in the power due to the distance between the transmitter and receiver. And therefore, you need to waste more power. So adaptive jammer is an intelligent jammer that first measures the distance between it himself and the target. And then, and then based on this distance, calculates, calculates exactly the path loss, the amount, the, 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 calculate by using uh, link budget, budget formulas, uh, fris formulas and some other formulas that are dependent on the environment, of course. The, the the jammer can predict how much power I should send so that I can uh, just I can just transmit enough power to degrade the communication, no more, no less. I will make it harder for others to detect me, and I will save my resources. I would not need to send more power than what I need. This is the fourth jammer, and the detec the detection of an adaptive jammer is challenging in the sense that it will dynamically adjust its jamming power to conceal its existence. And this is what I just mentioned. Because when you are when you have the capability of playing with your power and adjusting it, you 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 will make it difficult for the detector to sense or know that you are there. The last type is intelligent jammer or a smart jammer, control jammer, where weaknesses of the upper layer protocols or even the physical layer protocols. Here you exploit weaknesses. You are not adaptive. You are not adaptively jamming or reactive jamming or in intermittent jamming or constant jamming. Here you are exploiting some bugs, some weaknesses, some flaws, some something in the layers whether it's application network transport or even physical these these weaknesses are exploited exploited for blocking the legitimate transmission so denial of service attacks such as smart attack tcb udb flooding malware attacks all are examples of intelligent jammer so give me an example of an intelligent jammer operating at the physical layer i will tell you just simply jam the pilots. You know, you know, we all know in order to establish a communication, a successful communication between the transmitter and receiver and start our data link, we need, before we start the, 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 the official communication, we need to estimate the channel response between the transmitter and receiver. Why would we need to estimate the channel response? Because the channel causes impairments to our transmitted data. And if we want to receive this data correctly, we need first to know the channel so that at the receiver side, we can compensate and equalize the effect of the channel and get rid of it. And by doing so, you can be able to get your data and decode it successfully. If you don't know the channel, 
you will not be able to decode your data successfully because because the data keeps affecting your received signal and the, 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 the channel, sorry, keeps affecting your data at the reception side. And uh, as long as you cannot get rid of the channel, you cannot receive your data. So th this indicates the importance and the criticality of estimating the channel as perfect as possible before you, you before you start your communication. Otherwise, you will be you will you, you will just lose all the packets that are being communicated to you. So this is an example of an attack. So a, a smart attacker, intelligent attacker, will attack instead of just keep uh, blindly and randomly jamming uh, the whole communication. I would rather just focus on jamming the pilot signals that start at the beginning of the communication. So I just jam those pilot signals and once I make sure the receiver is not able to estimate his channel, then boom, he is not able to receive his data. That's it. Uh, another attack, CB, the CB part of the OFDM. We know the CB is responsible for protecting the transmission against intersymbol interference and multipath dispersion. So if, if you attack the CB, the circularity in the CB, you will break the orthogonality of the OFDM. Imagine you are breaking the orthogonality of the subcarriers with each other. What would happen? Any misalignments in the positions of the subcarriers of the OFDM will literally kill your communication. And that's so critical. Now I'm giving here a link. I call it die Wi-Fi jammer using node MCU. I, this link teaches you how to conduct jamming attack by simply using a very cheap ESP, uh, a very cheap microcontroller called node MCU. And the price of this microcontroller is less than $10. You can conduct a jamming on a Wi-Fi router, on a Wi-Fi access point, and stop the communication at any location you want. So imagine you are you are uh, fed up of your uh, of someone. You are uh, angry with him. He's annoying you. You want to attack him. It's no longer boxing. It's no longer physical power. It's no longer um, weapons and those things. We have now in this era, in this digital uh, crazy era, we have other weapons. We have the network weapon, the Wi-Fi weapon, the wireless weapon. And this one of the weapons you can use to take revenge or attack something or fix something. But I'm giving here just for learning education. Don't use it for illegitimate purposes, illicit uh, other activities that are not, not allowed. Uh, be, be, otherwise, you will be fully responsible for this. So here, the basic thing is basic homework for you. Of course, for those who want to do the homework, my style, I don't force anybody to do any homework. I like to, people who, to do homeworks because of their soul, because they internally believe that this is going to help them. So if you have an ESP node or you want to learn about ESP, my undergrad students who are taking my communication course, all of them, they are expert in programming ESP32. And they are expert in designing amazing applications, amazing softwares out of this. They even use their Android, control it, block it, sensing, actuating, amazing stuff. Each and every semester, I collect more than 40 projects they made and they sell them to customers. So basically, if you want to learn this, if you don't know about this, it's a golden opportunity for you. I'm providing you the link. I'm assuring you it's easy and simple. And if you don't, if you cannot afford buying uh, a, a microcontroller of 10, of 20 uh, Turkish lira, 30 Turkish lira, I have some free my, uh, additional microcontrollers. You come to my office, I will lend you some of them. You can do your project. And when you finish, you can return them back so that other students can use them. But this is just simple fun. You can play with it whenever you have time, maybe after you finish your semester. For those of you who are not, who are not what? Who are not having enough time to do any more homeworks. Yes. So in the previous slides, 
uh, I also put another link, amazing link, called GPS jamming. Well, what's GPS? We know GPS is the technology responsible for uh, giving, giving you information about your exact location. And uh, you know that we receive these signals from the satellites, yes? So the satellites are on the sky, and the distance between sky and uh, Earth is so much. And by the time the signal reaches the ground, it's almost like dead. It's, it's, it's so weak that all what you need as a jammer is just little amount of power, and you can stop GPS coverage in a certain area. So this is another weapon, you, lo you know how to use it as well. So we are revealing and revealing secrets here to you, making you uh, an advanced, solid, resilient, robust soldier, electronic soldier, yes? Anyway, so here if uh, somebody asks us to compare between all these different jamming attacks in terms of energy efficiency, jamming effectiveness, complexity, and the prior knowledge, let's, let's list them here in this table. Clear the mess up. So we have the constant jammer, the intermittent jammer, the reactive jammer, adaptive jammer, and the intelligent jammer. Uh, which one, which one has the highest energy efficiency? Which one you think? Of course, it's not the constant jammer because it, 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 it just drains your battery. It just keeps transmitting and wasting power. So there is no energy efficiency. So intermittent jammer also, it's not so efficient. Reactive jammer, a little bit better because it transmits only when there is a signal between the transmitter and receiver. It, get, it, it, it stays silent when there is no communication. So it's a little bit more, more efficient. Adaptive jammer, it's, it's, it's more efficient than reactive jammer. Why? Because it adjusts its transmit power according to the location and path loss. Intelligent jammer is the highest. Is the, pay, the highest energy efficient jammer is intelligent jammer. Why is that? Because all what you need is to, to jam, not the data. You jam only side information data. Information, we call this information control information. That's so critical to make your detection possible. If you block, if you prevent the receiver from, detect, from estimating his channel, from synchronizing, from uh, locking to the CP and uh, maintaining orthogonality, then you are you are killing the reception. So this is how we understand how we compare them with each other. So in the exam, you might expect an, a question like this: Which of the following is the most efficient in terms of power, in terms of energy? And I bought five options for you, so you know what to answer now. What about the jamming effectiveness? Which one is the most effective jammer? So honestly, the most effective one, killer one, the most strongest jamming is the constant jammer. He's killing you. He's transmitting all the time. He's killing everything, destroying the communication totally. Intermittent jammer is adjustable. Reactive jammer, adaptive jammer. So we are putting here, them here high, high, high. But there, there are some differences between them. Inte intelligent jammer, uh, for example, you can avoid intelligent jamming if you are aware of it. You can, for example, uh, design a scheme where you don't need to transmit uh, to estimate the channel from the pilots. You can estimate it, estimate the channel uh, from training sequence that that's being sent ahead of the time, or you can encrypt the training sequence so that he doesn't recognize that this is a training sequence and I should jam it. The complexity, in terms of complexity, a constant jammer, it's no, it's super easy to implement, no complexity, you just uh, prepare the circuit and keep keep sending signals at a, at a certain frequency. It's the, the, the dumbest, and most idiot jamming. So it's, 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 it's super easy to implement. The intermittent jammer, you need a little bit of intelligence. Reactive, a little bit more. Adaptive jammer, more and more. Intelligent jammer is the most. The complexity of implementing intelligent jammer requires 
a very good programmer, very good hacker, very good cracker who knows stuff. He knows how to code in Python. He knows how to uh, simulate OFDM. He knows the ins and outs of each and every single line of code in the simulation of OFDM or the modulation schemes. What about prior knowledge? So do I need any prior knowledge to launch, launch my attack? In constant jammer, I don't know little. I just need the frequency that uh, the, the, the communication operates on. For intermittent jammer, I still little, still low. Reactive jammer, moderate. You, you, you need to know uh, you need to know when they start communicating, when they stop. Adaptive jammer. You need more information, you need to know the distance, you need to know the path loss, the fading, how, the blockage, if there is any blockage, you need to predict how much the signal will be at the receiver. So it, the the prior knowledge, the prior information knowledge required is more. Intelligent jammer is the highest. You need to know the details of pilots, the details of channel estimation, the details of the standard document, how they implement the stuff and how to code it, how to hack it, how to implement. So intelligent jammer, as you can see, it's high on all parameters. Prior knowledge, complexity, jamming, and why is high in all the parameters? Because it's the most effective jamming technique. So that's why the intelligence should be extremely high. So with this, we finish our lecture on jamming. I hope you enjoyed it. You learned a little bit about jamming, the ins and outs, and how to launch jamming attacks, and how to defend against them, and what you need to do, and how to jam a GPS signal, how to build a jammer using Node, Node, uh, Node MCU, which is ESP32 or ESP86, which are very cheap stuff, but you can use them to make some harm to the access point. So thank you everybody and take care, stay blessed and see you in the next lecture.